Good morning uh, and welcome to this session on building a sustainable ocean recovery. My name is Jim Leap. I'm the co-director of the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford University. I want to welcome you to this session convened by the Friends of Ocean Action as part of the World Economic Forum's fourth Sustainable Development Impact Summit, this year online virtually for the, full, for the first time. Friends of Ocean Action was launched two and a half years ago in the wake of the first UN Ocean Conference. And in those two and a half years, it has become a unique platform in the ocean community. It is a connector, bringing existing initiatives together in common cause. It is also a catalyst of new collaborations. Over these couple of years, the Friends of Ocean Action has brought industry and governments together to tackle the challenge of ocean plastic. It has helped spur commitments to crack the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. It is mobilizing heads of state, leading companies, technologists, and NGOs to close the Pacific to illegal fishing. 2020 this year was of course supposed to be the super year for the ocean. We were supposed to be gathering together in person in a string of international convenings in the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, in the Our Ocean Conference in Koror, Palau, the CBD COP in Dalian, and the Climate COP in Glasgow. That promised to be a year that could really make a difference. Um, and the COVID pandemic has disrupted that schedule, but it has brought home also the urgency of finding a way to make a difference. So even meeting this way, we have to be sure that this year and the year that follows are indeed super. That we are using this time to rise to the challenge of putting the world on a path to resilience, both in the ocean and in society. And that's the mission of this session, is to come together and, and promote, develop actionable solutions for a healthy ocean. It must be an integral part in the global response and recovery from the COVID pandemic. To take us into that, we have some extraordinary speakers for this opening plenary session, and then we'll, we will then go into breakouts. The plenary is live streamed. We will start with keynote speakers and then go to a panel discussion. We'll have some discussion around the, among the members of the panel, and then if time allows, questions from the audience. So please put your questions into the chat box. We will then go into breakouts. You will be automatically assigned, which is why there will be a number next to your name. Um, it tells you which group you will be directed into. Those three breakouts will look at sustainable ocean pr production to nourish billions, capital to finance a sustainable ocean economy, and ocean and community resilience. We start appropriately with Peter Thompson. As president of the UN General Assembly, Peter led the convening of the first ever UN Ocean Conference in 2017 that has propelled our progress. And he is now the Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean and the Chair of the Friends of Ocean Action. Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. And uh, Prime Minister, very good to see you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. All courtesies observed and greetings to everyone gathered here with us in cyberspace. And whatever your circumstances in these trying times, I hope that you and your families are safe and well. <clears throat> in spite of my croaky voice, my wife has just put her head through the door to say that our COVID tests have just come through and we're negative. So this family is okay. I wanna thank the Friends of Ocean Action for organizing today's high level gathering and congratulations to the Friends for all that they've achieved on SDG 14's behalf to date. And we look forward to the Friends of Ocean Action attaining even higher levels of momentum and success in the coming years. Why are the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement so important to us all? Basically, taken together, they represent humanity's best effort at creating a plan for a secure future for the human species. The plan was universally agreed to by the Member States of the United Nations in 2015, even though we are currently failing in implementing it at the pace required, it remains our best plan, and it is our generational responsibility to see it faithfully through. You've heard me often enough say that at the climate change COP in Madrid last December, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, stated that we are knowingly destroying the life support systems of our planet. I ask you to ponder the implications of that statement and the fact that his words were based on the best scientific information that we have on the subject, namely the reports of the IPCC and IPBES. The current rate of global biodiversity loss is estimated to be between 100 to 1,000 times higher than the naturally occurring background extinction rate. And this 
is scientifically forecast to be the continuing direction in coming years. We don't change our ways. So that is why all of us have this existential responsibility to stay true to the plan, to work for sustainability and resilience, and to change our patterns of consumption, production, and habitat destruction so that biodiversity will be protected, so that the ocean's health is restored and we avoid the worst of the looming climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say some words about the blue-green recovery road that we must surely take out of the pandemic that we're currently living through. And I want to make the point that the sustainable blue economy is one of the most reliable stepping stones along the road opening up ahead. By way of example, I commend to you one of the recent reports issued by the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, entitled, A Sustainable Ocean Economy for 2050, Approximating Its Benefits and Costs. The report provides very positive findings, including the fact that after expert economic analysis, sustainable ocean-based investments yield returns at least five times greater than their costs. I ask you to consider those findings within the context of our times. The trillions of dollars now being earmarked for recovery and stimulus packages can be a crucial lever for shifting from past models of pollution and overexploitation of finite planetary resources to a sustainable route, delivering on our greed plan and bringing us to a carbon neutral world that we need and so desire. In support of this new route, the High Level Panel's report proposes five priority opportunities for immediate investment of stimulus funds to support a sustainable and equitable blue recovery from the COVID pandemic. And I commend them to your thoughts and discussions today. Here are the five. Invest in coastal and marine ecosystem restoration and protection. Invest in sewerage and wastewater infrastructure for coastal communities. It's a favor of mine. Thirdly, invest in sustainable community-led non-fed marine aquaculture, for example, shellfish and seaweed. Fourthly, incentivize zero emission marine transport. And fifthly, incentivize sustainable ocean-based renewable energy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just close my remarks now with some quick words about the UN Ocean Conference. As you know, the UN has mandated the holding of the next UN Ocean Conference to be held in Lisbon and to be co-hosted by the governments of Kenya and Portugal. Because of the pandemic, the holding of the conference has been postponed until 2021 with confirmed dates to be announced once the course of the pandemic is clearer. In the meantime, step-by-step -step preparations for the conference, and in fact, I've just come off a call from, with the Portuguese government, are proceeding. And I'm confident that like the first UN Ocean Conference in 2017, the Lisbon one will be another global game changer in favor of SDG 14's successful attainment. So I look forward to seeing you all virtually or in purpose, uh, person in Lisbon next year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, great pleasure and privilege to introduce the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, uh, the Honorable Alan Michael Chastanet. The Prime Minister concurrently serves as St. Lucia's Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service. He's a busy man. He holds a master's degree in development banking, respectively from Bishop's University in Quebec and the American University in Washington, DC. And for the purposes of our gathering today, I'd like to emphasize that Prime Minister Chastanet has had extensive experience in the tourism field, having in the past served as St. Lucia's Director of Tourism, as Managing Director of Cocoa Resorts, and as a former president of the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association. Prime Minister Chastanet, you have the floor, sir. There, thank you very much, uh, Peter. First of all, uh, I know that you were uh, attempting to make me feel very welcome with the picture you have behind you. Uh, yeah. A beautiful shot, it looks like, of uh, one of our pitons in St. Lucia. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to say that there's some really good news on the front here in the OECS um, and in CARICOM. So CARICOM now has uh, finalized an exercise last year in which we now have appropriately demarcated all of um, our um, 
uh, blue economy space. So in fact, the boundaries between all of us now have been settled. And that's a very important um, first step because that now gives us the legal ability to start now looking to commercialize um, our space. Sadly, for a region of the world where the amount of blue uh, economy that we have in terms of land space is substantially larger than what we have in physical space, we still don't look enough um, to try to manage and uh, to develop the blue economy to the extent that we have. Here in St. Lucia, we've seen two initiatives. One, clearly uh, a young gentleman who has gotten a tremendous amount of accolades um, for converting sagassum into um, a fertilizer. And sagassum continues to play havoc um, with our beaches and our primary economy, tourism. And secondly, that we've seen um, a new industry called uh, CMOS. Um, to Peter's point, where this is a renewable uh, product in the ocean that is doing extremely well. I think that we've seen almost a thousand percent increase in sales of CMOS. And I think that we're only at the tip um, of, the, uh, of, of the potential of what that product um, offers. But before we can even get to the blue ocean, there are some other issues that are ailing the small um, island developing states. And, and Peter, very familiar with them from where he came from before. And, and the problem is, is that we've now had three major shocks, the financial crisis, climate change in terms of hurricanes, and now the pandemic. And the combination of these things have literally depleted the financial resources of our countries. Uh, St. Lucia's debt to GDP, in four years, I was able to bring it down um, to 59%. So 1% below the prudential level set by the IMF. In a matter of six months, that's gone from 60% to 85%. And depending on what the growth rate is actually going to be this year, because we're projecting a 26% decline in our GDP. And if it's worse than that, it means that the debt to GDP is going to go up even higher. And certainly right now, no one knows with any level of certainty what's going to happen next year. Um, most of us would have hoped by this point that we would have seen a more um, convincing uh, return to our economies and that we could say with some kind of confidence um, that the global economy would be recovering significantly and we would only see a marginal decline um, from the previous year. And certainly would be maybe two to three years away from getting back to our pre-COVID um, uh, size economies. But today, I don't think any of us can say that with any level of certainty. And the implications of that is that we saw a 50% decline in our tax revenues. Tax revenues, which I really, I, I, I call free capital. I don't have to go and borrow that. That's money that the government has earned through taxation. 50%, $600 million. We had to go out and borrow to, to, to make that up. And while the borrowing has been at extremely concessional rates through the IMF and the World Bank and through CDB and our own central bank, we're talking about five to 10 year moratoriums, a half a percent to a maximum of one and a half percent interest over 20 to 40 years, very concessional. So I don't think the country is gonna have any difficulty in paying for the debt. But the problem is, is that the more debt we take on, given the fiscal rules that we have of measuring the wealth of my country by per capita, um, uh, debt to GDP, sorry, and per capita income, we're in, we're in problems. And, and, and I say this, and I bring this up at this particular juncture, because there's no conversation that we can currently have that can take place until we resolve this issue because the states are not going to have the resources to invest themselves to take advantage of the blue economy. Putting pressure on small island developing states to become totally carbon neutral, when we know that we're not the ones that are making and inflicting the pain on, 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 on globally is a heavy burden. 
So I can say to you as a prime minister, um, looking at LNG gas as an example is a significant reduction in carbon emissions, but can produce energy at a much cheaper cost than right now than what any form of green energy can. And LNG comes with the ability of getting persons to make the investment um, without me having to make the investment. The same can't be said of green energy. So we have to resolve this problem that's not going away. We, we said it during climate change after 2017 when we had hurricanes Irma and Maria, that there is a requirement for us to invest in resilience. And investing in resilience means my debt to GDP goes up. The return on that investment is simply building resilience. It's not building capacity. Building a bridge higher, it carries the same number of cars. Now the matters become even worse because we've had to immediately borrow money with whatever fiscal space that we had created, it's now gone. So we need help if we're going to, to create an institution within the Caribbean that can help us now examine the opportunities with um, the blue economy. I agree with Peter that this is only going to be successful if the citizens of our countries benefit from this opportunity. So it means that we have to create an incubator, we have to create an equity fund um, to invest in these areas. Otherwise, what we're, see, what we're doing here today is just talk. Because the reality is, is that the expectations of what we can do to meet this new opportunity are, are, are limited now and are becoming even less to us moving down the road. So we have said four things. OECD needs to move immediately to using a vulnerability index to measure small island developing states access to concessional funding. Cannot use per capita GDP as that criteria. The evidence of the financial crisis, the evidence of climate change, and now the evidence of the pandemic show that per capita GDP is a meaningless number because in absolute terms, it's a limited number because of our populations. The second thing that we've continued to ask for is a change in the governed structures of the IFIs. I mean, the British government gave solution the Caribbean when Cameron was prime minister, $300 million. Seven years later, we might be able to see the expenditure starting maybe in January. That's absurd, F free money. And that's, that's the governed structure. And even now with the pandemic, when we said, okay, let's repurpose some of our loans in anticipation of a very heavy hurricane season, which has manifested, here we are in October, more than halfway through the hurricane season, and we've not been able to repurpose those loans to do what? To fix up shelters because now we can put less people in the existing shelters because of COVID and to use some of the money for desilting. October. Now, if, if, if everyone sitting at the table can't use common sense to some extent and bypass some of these governed structures to actually solve a problem, and if that's going to be the continual behavior that we're going to have, we're not going anywhere. The third thing that we've said is a dedicated fund for the SIDS. You have the Green Climate Fund. It's now in its second tranche. The first time, nothing for the SIDS. Every time we have to go and apply, it's, it's a, new, a new level that you have to use to become an agent. You have to become a promoter. You have to become this in order to be able to get the monies. We're spending more time trying to get, the, get through the administrative hurdles than actually getting the funds to be able to achieve something. And the fourth thing that we clearly said even before the pandemic is how are we going to deal with the debt? In our opinion, the debt that you're accumulating um, for resilience either has to be amortized over a longer period of time and only proportionately brought onto your books, or it needs to be a below the balance sheet item. So it's not a matter of us not paying for it, but it's simply the ability um, of us absorbing that kind of money. And even now with the pandemic, imagine having to absorb $600 million 
from in three months. It's crazy. Even though the funds are on a concessional basis. So I just want to say, gentlemen and ladies, that from a small island developing state, I see a tremendous opportunity in the blue economy, not only in terms of um, some of the things that um, David has spoken about, but Peter's talk, spoken about, but also the things that we've spoken about. We have the cruise ship economy. If in fact the Caribbean treated our space as a singular space, and we created a system in which we could license people coming into our area. Prime Minister, if I may, as an old friend, I support everything that you have just said there. Uh, in a world where the International Energy Agency has said we can produce 18 times global demand for electricity through offshore wind, and you know that's the Caribbean right there, and having got your electricity that we can, uh, for every boat that runs into or out of a Caribbean island that should be running on electricity the way the huge ferries of the Baltic are. So, you know, the solutions are there, but you put your finger on it with the finance side, and that's one of the uh, main areas of discussion this, this evening or this morning, I guess, in America. And with those words, uh, first, I want to thank you so much. You're such a great advocate for SIDS, uh, but you're such also a great advocate for logic uh, as to how we're going to make these solutions actually happen. Uh, and uh, with those words, I'll hand back to our moderator, Jim Leap, but I really look forward to discussions coming up in the panels. Thank you so much for your words, Prime Minister. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, Prime Minister. We couldn't have asked for a better this first opening remarks to tee up the discussion that follows. I mean, bringing home vividly just the practical realities of, of how these several crises are affecting a country like um, St. Lucia and the, and the connected importance of both the innovations in technology and society and governance, and at the same time, innovations in finance to make those reforms possible. So we really appreciate you being here with us um, and setting us on, on the path for this conversation. And we now have a great panel to take us into those, um, into those issues. Uh, we have three panelists who we will hear from here in plenary. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we will go into breakouts at the top of the hour. Uh, the first is M. Sanjan, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Conservation International, as you might guess uh, from his background, um, one of the world's leading uh, international conservation organizations. The second is um, Barka Masai, who is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper, which is a fancy way of saying that she is a serious leader uh, in her own country of Port Louis, uh, of Mauritius, in, based in Port Louis, uh, and well beyond. Um, and the third is Jonquil Hackenberg, who is the head of sustainable business from Infosys, the legendary IT company. So let's plunge into a first um, set of, of observations from the panel, and then we'll get into a bit of discussion from there. Um, Sanjan, I'm, Sanjan, I'm going to start with you. Um, so, I mean, we've heard uh, from the speakers about the central importance of the oceans to a uh, post-COVID recovery. Can you begin to set out for us the sort of core, what you see as the core elements of that recovery agenda? Uh, well, thank you, uh, and great to be here. And I, I'm blown away by the words that we just heard from the prime minister. I mean, I, I could have, I honestly could have listened to him for, for a long time. He, he had such clarity of thought and purpose and all of the stuff that we discuss in kind of these forums, somewhat esoteric, somewhat removed from the real challenges that people are facing on the ground was really brought uh, to bear through, through his words. And you could just clearly see uh, the passion and the struggle that he is facing. Um, you know, I, I, let me point to three key areas that I think that we ought to spend some time focusing on that would clearly be key ingredients of a build better recovery. Um, you know, yes, this was supposed to be a super year for conservation for biodiversity. I think the one thing that this year certainly has achieved, unfortunately, but still achieved, is that I don't think anyone is taking nature for, um, uh, the importance of nature has been made, made incredibly clear to us, uh, either in small personal ways or kind of at the global, the global scale. 
but it still tends to be a terrestrial led conversation. Uh, I'm struck at by at how much momentum there is with carbon and forest conservation and restoration on the terrestrial side, but the oceans are, are really, really lagging. We just don't have that 20 years to catch up. So let me point to three sort of core areas. The first is the importance of marine protected areas and the link back of marine protected areas to economies, from tourism to uh, resilience for coastlines to obviously fisheries at, you know, at large. We have uh, only a fraction of the ocean protected. I don't want to get into exactly what that number is because it depends on how you count it. But I think that there's quite good consensus that we need at least 30% of the planet under some form of strong conservation management. And when it comes to the oceans, we're nowhere, nowhere near it. So we, for example, are partnering with several other organizations, including Pew and Minderu and the GEF, to really focus on 18 million square kilometers of ocean, about 5% of what we need, and really on a, on a quick push to try to get that uh, over the next 10 years. Um, the second is fisheries. And when I talk about fisheries, I am specifically uh, focusing on community-based fisheries, the off-market fisheries that over half the planet depends on and over half the fishers uh, whose livelihoods completely depend on it. As you think about the recovery, as we start working through the recovery, that is the place to really lean in. You, you know, um, I'm just thinking about this because emphasis is in the conversation, but you know, when, when Modi shut down India, initially with this quite draconian 21 days of lockdown, and I'm not going into whether it worked or not. He did make a certain point, which I thought was very, very, very good. He basically said that if we don't lock down India for 21 days, we're gonna, we're gonna push it back by 21 years. And what he meant by that really is that most of the planet you know, still relies very much on a rural economy, where I am confident that all of the money that is going into the recovery, certainly in the United States, is going towards the big industries, the key sectors, that are city-based, the rural economy is getting completely left behind. And that's where the oceans and the fisheries and the fisher communities, particularly these community-based fisher communities comes into play. You know, if, if that rural urban migration that has been going on as long as I've been alive, for the first time I bet has reversed. And that means that for that one family who sent someone into the city to make money in order to send that first person to school, that's now been pushed back by an entire generation, regardless of how quickly the recovery happens. So that's why community-based fisheries has to have enormous amount of support from us because it is a fast pathway for those rural economies. And then finally, blue carbon, nature-based solutions to climate, both on the adaptation side, but also on the mitigation side. We are surging ahead on the terrestrial side. I mean, just my organization alone in terms of partnerships with MasterCard or Apple or, um, or P&G, massive commitments to protect nature for climate, but virtually all of it is on the terrestrial side. Just this week, actually last week, we had the first blue carbon project. This was in Sisparta, Colombia, that received the carbon verification standards, the first carbon verification standards in the world for blue carbon. That just happened last week. So I, I think that if we want to see what I think is the largest transfer of wealth from, from the rich to the not so rich that we're going to see in conservation, which is essentially driven by the need to protect forests and carbon rich environments, we also need to um, stimulate the nature-based climate solutions that are coming from the oceans, from mangroves, coral reefs, coastal communities. Um, so thank you. Anjan, thank you very much. Um, that's a perfect tee up for, um, for this discussion. Uh, so Barka, I want to turn to you. Um, your country has witnessed terrible environmental disasters over the last several months with the big oil spill has been also hard hit by the pandemic. And yet you are, have been continuing to lead and, and speak out for the importance of sustainable ocean management at the center of the response to those crises. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about from that perspective. I mean, what does a blue recovery look like uh, in Mauritius and, and in the broader region? 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thanks for having me on the panel. Um, and I would just like to point out that prior to joining this panel, um, I spoke to fellow shapers from the Victoria Hub in Seychelles, from the Rodrigues Hub and from the Port Louis Hub. So this is very much the voice of young people from the Indian Ocean. Um, when we talk about blue recovery, initially at the start of the year, we were thinking, let us tide through the COVID-19 pandemic and then the MV Wakashio vessel crashed headlong into one of our most important coral reefs in Mauritius and later broke apart, spilling at least 1000 tons of bunker fuel and other toxins into a very ecologically sensitive area. It is a very, very tragic event. And I believe it is perhaps a turning point in the history of Mauritius. Um, and its impacts will only be known after a few months. It, they will keep unfolding. But there are at least four lessons that we can take from this lesson, in, from this uh, tragedy that we will have to use to build back better. The first is what this has shown is the absolute need to center agile governance as a key pillar of promoting the blue economy. At the moment, there are so many exciting developments that are happening um, in various hubs, in various technological hubs, whether we're talking about autonomous vehicles, satellite data, um, biotech or synthetic biology. All of these innovations are crucial to steering, the, to clearing the path for a blue economy that is sustainable, exciting, and also inclusive. However, the public sector does not necessarily match the pace of that innovation, and we need it to do that. This is the first point. The second point is building a blue economy based on people-driven innovation. I'm sure that you have heard the moment local people in Mauritius heard that oil was leaking out on the, of the uh, MV Wakashio, they rushed to the coast and they started cutting their own hair in an attempt to build booms to contain the oil spill. There were makeshift booms, but online there was also mobilization with people trying to come up with different models, different ideas, the diaspora united. Um, and all this wealth of ideas needs to have an outlet. If in the space of a crisis, people can come up with ideas, imagine what they can do if you give them the space to build a blue economy that is centered on their ideas. This is something we have also witnessed um, as a shaper with, uh, with Seeing Blue, an initiative that was shaper-led, where young people from coastal communities came up with such brilliant ideas, which needed to be plugged into um, policy, which needed to be supported by the right systems, which needed to be supported by mentorship and funds. At the moment, the response to the Bakashi is also um, fixed on one citizen-led data collection um, effort to assess the ongoing impacts and local knowledge has been critical. So we cannot have a blue economy, uh, a recovery for a blue, uh, based on a blue, uh, blue economy unless you have the people right at the center. The third point is data, data and more data. But I believe Yonkil will speak about it. So a lot of the questions that are being asked is, that are being asked are that, how could a vessel of this magnitude just crash into a reef? How come we don't know about vessels? How come we don't know about our oceans? Now that we have so much technology at our disposal, there is no excuse whatsoever for coastal countries, for people in coastal countries not to know what is in their waters. This is absolutely crucial that we bring science-led um, policy and that it is made in such a transparent manner that people can get involved. And the final thing, uh, Jim, the fourth uh, lesson that we learned from this very sad event is the necessity to invest further in regenerative technology. At this point in time, um, we, are, we are heading to a point where Regenerative technology was seen something as a, oh, I've given up, there's nothing more to be done, so this is not something we should be considering. But what we've seen, the impact in the mangroves, the impact 
um, on the local coast, the Southeast coast, we will need to be investing in that. And finally, Jim, um, the prime minister of St. Lucia made a lot of important points that strongly resonated with me as someone from a small island developing state. At the start of the pandemic, there was a sense of purpose and people thought, okay, climate change, we have an initial drop in, uh, in uh, emissions. Uh, we recognize that inequality is a big deal unless everyone is safe, nobody is safe. Biodiversity, we recognize the need to protect wildlife, otherwise the risk of zoonotic diseases will increase. But then all of that was reversed after the initial drop in emissions, we had record high emissions. After the initial recognition of inequality, we realized that there has been pandemic profiteering, obscene pandemic profiteering, a high level of public debt, which will affect my generation in particular, loss of jobs and income, and biodiversity, we just had the Living Planet report, which is very, very depressing. But all of this goes to show that there has been an individualization of responsibility, which is a very damaging myth. We need people to design systems, the public sector to set them up, and the private sector to optimize and use them. Thank you, Jim. Parker, thank you. Um, I think you've brought into sharp sharp relief the, the the multiple dimensions of rising to this challenge and and actually the difficulty of sustaining that sense of common purpose that characterized the early days of the pandemic so um so so thank you for that uh Junko, i want to turn to you um i think over the last six months all of us have become more digital in our daily lives uh for better or for worse um but we certainly have a keen interest in in how the the emerging power of digital technology can make a difference on the challenges um, we're talking about here. Um, what opportunities do you see for a digital technology to help advance uh, ocean health and build a more resilient uh, ocean and society? Yeah, thanks, Jim. So it's a, it's, it's a brilliant question. I think what struck me about the opening part of this whole debate is how do we make this tangible and not keep it at high level ivory tower discussions, right? So. There's so many brilliant solutions out there, like at grassroots level in different countries and different geographies with different um, societal aims and goals. And, and so, I, so if we take, I'll take a couple of uh, examples of companies that I've mentored over the last um, couple of years. So one is, for example, Sati, Sati Pads. They, they create um, sanitation products for women from banana stem fibers. That would be one example, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Ocean Bottle, they, they use recycled plastic from the ocean to create beautifully designed water bottles. These grassroots startups are amazing, supported by investment funds like Catapult Ocean, and, and, and that's brilliant. Now, where I see digitalization come in is number one, to join these stories together. So, so how do we start communicating all these amazing things? We, we heard from the Prime Minister of St. Lucia about Sargasso and, and the opportunities there and the startup there. Three years ago, I was in Mexico and Tulum having exactly the same conversation. So is, is Mexico and St. Lucia talking? Um, you know, how do we start to drive these conversations so that um, we start to see the, the power of... Um, that's greater than one single organization or, or one idea. So digitalization in that regard gives the opportunity for co connectivity and digital ecosystems to share knowledge. Um, the second thing it does, and, and I think this is crucial based upon the announcement of the common ESG metrics. I believe so far that as we've measured ESG, e, the E has been really prominent and the S and G have, have not been. They've kind of taken a back seat. And I think they need to be considered in equal importance so that when there is an idea, it needs to be supporting the local society and it also needs to be supporting, for example, diversity in, in the G as a simple example. So by having that common set of metrics against which large corporates can sign up and agree to, that means there is a single direction which many companies in the digital ecosystem can contribute to. That's critical, otherwise we're going to have lots of grassroots ideas that have wonderful traction in a very localized space, but we need, to, we need to exponentially grow this very, very quickly. The other thing with digitalization, coming back to your point, Barker, about data, for sure, data's key. 
Um, but it's also about providing transparency. So exposing and, and promoting transparency of, for example, supply chains across, across the oceans, um, whether that's shipping, whether that's fishing, whatever it might be, that transparency and visibility is something that large tech, large digitalization can provide and technologies with microservices that that connect into the, the smaller ideas means that you can bring this together to have a greater power. So, so I, I feel that digitalization from a corporate level provides communication and provides measurement and progress. And it also provides the ability to have exponential uh, progress. Right. Thank you, Junko. Um, there, are, there are so many threads we could pull out of, of this conversation and, and we have limited time. I want to I want to pull one and coming from Silicon Valley, not surprising, perhaps which one I choose. Um, but I want to pick up on your uh, your remarks on technology and, and and circle back to the panel on on how that thread could run through the several things we're talking about. And, and Sandra, and I'll start with you. Um, I mean, you would of the several things you emphasize. I mean, one was the the, the vital role of small scale fishers um, in in rural economies and in rural food security and, and their centrality to building a resilient economy. As you think about that ambition, I mean, what thoughts do you have about the role technology can play in technological innovation can play in, in helping us to create a brighter future for those communities? You can also talk about MPAs if you like, um, but great if you could start with small scale fishers. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so look, I think everyone would agree that technology has a enormous role to play. Um, I think we've all been I did my graduate work in, 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 in Silicon Valley as well, in that, in that part of the world. And, you know, when I was in grad school, we were stunned at the leaps that were happening in technology. I'm still stunned at it. I'm also somewhat disappointed about how little it's been applied into conservation and particularly real world conservation problems at scale. So, you know, outside of the study of the very, very big. So being able to see the planet from space and being able to map it, um, whether it's a GIS, ArcInfo, Esri system or Google Earth type of system, you know, that's one big innovation. The other one is the study of the very, very small, being able to get into sort of the DNA and understand lineages, parentage, population structures, et cetera. There hasn't been bigger breakthroughs outside of those two in tech. You know, conservation in the field still feels very much like the same conservation in the field that I was used to 30 years ago, whereas everything else from communications to banking to how I order my food, to how I travel when I travel again or not, has, has completely been revolutionized. So we've been waiting for this revolution. And the problem is it, it almost always starts and ends with drones. Um, so, the, so the challenge with the tech is not that the tech isn't there, but the, the folks who focus on tech aren't talking to the people on the ground who are dealing with kind of the real world challenges and then asking, how do you really scale it? So sometimes the tech is so far advanced that when you actually try to apply it in a place, you quickly run into, into a challenge. Um, uh, at other times, you know, you by applying tech, you actually take jobs away from people who you could be employing in another way. Now, I don't want to be negative about this by any any stretch of the imagination. You know, in Kiribati, you know, tech has been used amazingly to protect Phoenix Islands protected area with, with specific targeting of ships that have violated the marine protected area for tuna. Um, there are some amazing systems that are watching the oceans. New ones are being developed all the time. We're understanding, you know, um, marine carbon in a much more detailed way. Enric Sala and others, uh, you know, working on it through National Geographic. So I'm a big proponent of it, but I am also really making a plea that the folks who are thinking and working on those solutions understand the enormous barrier to applying it in the places that we need to save. Uh, West Papua, coast of Mozambique, West Africa, coast of Liberia, where the challenges, if you, if, you, if you just create the solution without the ability to implement and sustain that implementation, or implementation over time, um, it chokes out. It only becomes a cool example. Yeah, okay, no, great, thank you. Um, John Kwan, I'm gonna to come to you on the affordability in a second, but, be, uh, but first, um, Barca, 
I mean, you actually, one of the points you highlighted was the importance of, of data and of putting data in the hands of local communities so they know the resources that are at stake, so they're in a position to manage those resources better. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that? What's, what's that going to take? I mean, what are your ideas about how that happens, in part responding to the concerns that Sanjum has raised? Thank you for, for circling back to that point, Jim. Um, and actually, as uh, Sanjay was, was um, making his intervention, it, it really hit me that, indeed, we should be marrying technology and conservation, not politics and conservation. Um, because a lot of um, ocean-related ventures tend to be driven by heavily politicized agendas. Using data and putting it in the hands of communities, whether it's in a very um, granular form of getting everyone to keep tracking the change of the coastline, uh, the accumulation of um, oil, as has been the case in Mauritius, um, or building observatories in strategic points, whether using all the SIDS as networks to, to build those observatories. It is, it is really, really crucial to, to um, treat it as a public good and treat it with care. Obviously, there are some, um, some pieces of information that uh, for defense purposes cannot be shared, but data on the ocean should be a public good. And why that is also important is when we have been drafting blue economy strategies, and this is not new, countries have been drafting blue economy strategies for over a decade now, um, Many sectors in the blue economy are very capital intensive, technology intensive, which presents a barrier to the communities that are supposed to access the benefits of the blue economy. But having data identifying the gaps where um, local knowledge could be plugged in, or even those gaps where local innovation could be used to, to find a solution, would actually help us build a more inclusive blue economy. So at the moment, I, I'm very excited to see how the um, data collection by local citizens in Mauritius is going to play out. And I believe this could be a case study um, in the future for putting people right in the middle of something which we would say is something that can only be handled by experts, but actually is making use of local knowledge. So we shall see how that goes. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you. So, so John, we'll back to you. I mean, as I think, um, well, actually, both comments highlight uh, one of the clear challenges is has been, you know, what are business models that actually support the development and dissemination of, of de deployment of technologies that can be used by communities who are trying to manage their resources? So, and do you have ideas from your vantage point or examples from your vantage point of, of how people have cracked that challenge and, and begun to step up to some of the needs that, that Barca describes? It's a really good question. I'd say, I'd actually like to go back to the, the point that, um, what, why are we so far behind with ocean when we're fine with the earth and we're so far ahead? And I think it's because, I think generally people don't understand what water does and, and, and how important it is. We all live on the earth every single day. It's only those in island states that are living and breathing and feeling the impact of ocean. So I think to, to, to bring that back to the point of affordability and, and moving things forward is, is tying that understanding of, well, why is water critical to my business, my household, my life, my life, my, my future? And um, that needs to be completely cracked and exposed. And the point at which water then becomes a crisis for a given industry is then when when things start to shift so you're seeing in for example the consumer goods industry with the the loop model that was we talked about last year at, at this summit um, it, it's a, a brilliant example that goes down to end consumer that says well actually you can have recycled bottles for your shampoo or maybe you don't even need to have water in your detergent in the first place you could add you could add that afterwards so it's the understanding of what is in you know what is water and how important it is that's first of all number one and the technologies not necessarily it technologies but the i the technologies physical technologies to extract water from the original product is super key so I'd say Loop is a, a brilliant, brilliant example that's gathering pace in 
with Nestle, with Unilever and, and the likes, um, and P and G. Um, on, on a on a digital perspective, I think I think blockchain kind of got too big for its boots. Everybody thought blockchain was going to be this holy grail of amazingness, but actually the reality is. For, for those on the front line, those farmers, fishermen, they, they don't benefit from it at all. It's the corporates and the consumers who feel like, yes, we've done something good for the world. So, so we need to strip back everything, use technology like blockchain, like traceability solutions through integration to just expose very simply how everything is connected together and why it's important. It comes back to education. And, and simple technologies like QR code technology or, or traceability digital fingerprint ID is much cheaper to implement and can actually impact the end fisherman or, or um, farmer. Okay, no, thank you very much. And I'm really sorry that we are out of time um, because there's a lot to talk about here. And while I started with tech, I mean, just let me highlight that, uh, that we have also highlighted here the vital importance of governance of finding ways to forge common purpose on these challenges and, and, um, and on finding ways to mobilize the cash, the capital that will make meeting these challenges um, possible.